Welcome to the Healthy Skin Show with Jennifer Fugo, where we're flipping everything you've been told about your chronic skin issues upside down and connecting you with alternative solutions your dermatologist never told you about. Welcome back to episode number 182 of the Healthy Skin Show. This conversation is the part two that you guys have been waiting for all about that incredible research that I found where researchers discovered that Bacillus subtilis, this very specific strain of probiotic, could actually kill or get rid of Staph aureus. It's pretty fascinating stuff. If you missed that episode, please go back and check out episode 181 before listening to this episode. If you tuned in, I know that you're excited to hear the final half of this chat with my guest, Karan Krishnan. I got a lot of emails being like, when is the second part going to be released? Because this was just amazing. And so we're going to dive in today. My guest, in case you missed it, is Karan Krishnan. He is a research microbiologist and has been involved in the dietary supplement and nutrition market for the past 18 years. He comes from a university research background, having spent several years with hands-on R&D in the field of molecular medicine and microbiology at the University of Iowa. Karan established a clinical research organization where he designed and conducted dozens of human clinical trials in human nutrition. Karan is also a co-founder and partner in New Science Trading, a nutritional technology development and research company. And most of you might realize and know him as the co-founder and chief scientific officer at Microbiomes Labs. He's a frequent lecturer on the human microbiome at medical and nutrition conferences. He is an expert guest on national and satellite radio and has appeared on several international documentaries and has been a guest speaker on several international health summits as a microbiome expert. He is currently involved in 16 novel human clinical trials on probiotics and the human microbiome. And Karan is also on the scientific advisory board as a science advisor for seven other companies in the industry. Without further ado, we're going to dive into today's conversation and make sure to stick around after the conclusion of part two, because I have some really great tips that I share with my clients that I'd also like to share with you. All right, let's dive in. So with with the, with the bacillus subtilis and, and say someone is like, hey, I'm already on Megaspore or I want to give it a shot. Is this something where you know, you take one bottle or do it for two weeks and mm -hmm. poof, your staph aureus are, is gone. I mean, to me, it takes time mm -hmm. to kind of repattern the microbiome within the GI tract. For sure. It's, it's not a fast overnight. I, I think we're so used to medications where we expect this magical change within three days or yeah. seven days that that's going to happen. W what could you help give people some, I like to call it like a helping people manage their expectations. Mm -hmm. Like what are you looking for as far as timing is concerned? If staph aureus, it, you do have this in your GI tract or you have chronic staph problems, even at the level of the skin, what do you think more or less like someone should anticipate? It's obviously, this is not probably the only thing you're going to need to do, but yeah. it may be a really big, helpful partner in the process. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's an ecological shift, right? And, and one thing we have to remember is staff is a phenomenal competitor. So it's not like they're just going to go away quietly, right? So they're going to fight <laughs> back and, 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 uh, and it's going to be a battle and it'll, and it'll take some time. It's no different than, you know, changing the landscape of a, you know, forest or, um, you know, a really big complex garden. It takes a little bit of time to change that ecosystem. Uh, but, but the key here is consistency will get you to where you need to be, right? Yeah. Because the, what you're doing when you add in the, the spores is you're creating a new selection pressure in that ecosystem, right? It's like adding a new species into an ecosystem that's completely imbalanced. And this species is going to drive more balance but it does it through a number of ecological forces. It does it through the compounds it produces that, that inhibit the function of the pathogen. It does it by producing things like short chain fatty acids that help the beneficial bacteria. It produces um, compounds that actually feed like prebiotics some of your commensal bacteria. So your commensal bacteria become more robust and grow and then they can help 
compete against the pathogenic or opportunistic organisms. So there's this shift that happens over time. The problem occurs when you stop that that uh, that new ecological force, right? Mm. Let's say you take it for three weeks, four weeks, you're starting to get a shift, and then you stop because you forget, you're distracted by things, or it's not quite meeting your expectations just yet because right. we're used to, oh, I have an infection, I'm doing a three-day z pack, and then the infection's under control, right? It's not the same kind of mechanism. What we're looking at is a long-term permanent shift in your ecosystem, and that takes time. So I would say to people that many of our of the studies we're doing, we went from 30 days to see what happens to changes in the gut and all that within 30 days. And you can see some profound changes in 30 days, but really it's 90 days, yeah. you know, six months where you start to get yeah. more of that permanent shift. And you have to maintain that ecological pressure. So you have to keep the bacillus coming in because the bacillus is also designed naturally not to stay in your system forever. Right. Yeah, I was going to ask you that. Like, yeah. aren't aren't they more transient? They're mm -hmm. sort of like visitors that pass through, do the, their thing, and then after a certain period of time, they're kind of like, "I'm out of here." Like, I, I'm on to my next journey. That because that's what uh, um, at that conference where we met, that was one thing that was really impressed upon the audience in one of the talks that I was in is that probiotics are more transient. Mm -hmm. They move through, they do their business, and then they move on. Yeah. Um, so can you speak a little bit to that? Because I think people think, well, I took it for a month. They're in there now. Mm -hmm. I'm good. Right. No, yeah. Um, the reason why, and, and this is this is my reasoning, why I think that that especially bacillus tends to be transient in its in its functionality is because in a in a natural environment we're supposed to get a, quite a bit of exposure to bacillus right um, we get it from the ecosystem from soil and other areas so from drinking water and so on um, we're supposed to get a constant exposure to this organism the idea is that these organisms have kind of established their own threshold limit within the system they know that if they exceed the threshold limit, that's less beneficial to the ecosystem because the ecosystem does well having good balance and good diversity, right? That is that is the um, the picture of a healthy microbiome. It's it's good balance and good diversity. Lots of different species, pretty well balanced. So if you could have two hundred species, and if ten of them make up ninety percent. Of the, of the cell count, then you still don't have good balance within the system, right? You want 200 species with almost equal distribution of most of them. And so these organisms that are beneficial to our system that we've lived with for millions of years have figured that out. And when they reach certain threshold amounts, they tend to leave. And so they have this constant tendency to move down and through the digestive tract and then end up leaving. And for bacillus, it's even more important because they use the environment as a vector to get from host to host, right? So evolutionarily, they're designed to go through the system, clean up the system while they're in there, and then go back out to get to the next host, right? So that's how they transfer from person to person. In fact, um, glacial ice core studies on bacillus have shown that you know, uh, as far back as three to five million years ago, the same bacillus that are present in the environment today were present in those environments, in that ancient environment. And they were found in every corner of the earth, in the North Pole, in the South Pole, in the Tibetan plateaus. And they don't have wings to fly around, right? How do they get there? Once well, they get uh, transferred from different hosts, right? Whether it's birds, insects, mammals, you know, they, they colonize all kinds of things. Um, and so that transient quality is important to them. So you want to mm -hmm. keep constant exposure to them because they move through the small intestine, they do work in the small intestine, they do work in the large intestine, then they move out and they keep going and they keep doing that. Perfect. And okay, so I want to ask you some questions for people who are struggling with skin staph infections. Mm -hmm. So for example, right now I have a client who approached me needing help. And I could tell immediately from his symptoms, I'm like, I think you have a staph infection. You need to see a dermatologist ASAP because mm -hmm. this is going to get bad if you try to like manage this on your own. And yeah. it's to the point where he, they try, he desperately, he's gone through three different, uh, oral, uh, antibiotics. Mm -hmm. He's tried the topical antibiotic. None of it has worked. It's barely managed his symptoms. And now he's facing IV antibiotics mm. because it's so bad. So for someone who 
you know, they're, they're, they're trying the antibiotic thing and it's not helping and they're having oozing and they just cannot control staff at the level of the skin. Do you know of any, cause obviously we want to be careful here cause we're not suggesting you start like applying things to wounds right. and things of that nature. want to be very clear about that, but is, is, do you have any thoughts about like, obviously I think it would make sense to me that potentially some oral supplementation could be helpful mm -hmm. in this whole process. But we've talked about in the past of using Megaspore topically. Um, and we talked about in that in the two episodes that you were on um, in the pretty much the beginning of the Healthy Skin Show. Any thoughts on somebody who even if they don't have wounds or anything like that, like maybe let's just say they have issues where they go, they swing in and out of uh, chronic skin staph infections. So obviously there's an issue there, yeah. right? There's an issue with the skin microbiome being able to hold a more healthy balance. Mm -hmm. Could the the bacillus species applied topically possibly also crowd out? Because we've talked about the gut and crowding out the gut staff. Could it possibly help also crowd out that the skin microbiome, uh, the staff that lives there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, one of the things that bacillus does well is crowd out pathogens on almost any kind of surface. So we've actually done uh, a, a small internal study on the phone. Right, phones tend to be really, really dirty things uh, when it comes to presence of pathogens, fecal matter, and all of that stuff. Um, and so we've we've actually been able to show that even on your phone, you the the spores can work to to exclude uh, the functionality of pathogens. So so yes, theoretically it can. We haven't done any studies on on the topical surface. We do intend to do that, uh, but keep in mind that. When you're in a, in a natural environment, you've got a healthy microbiome, you've got bacillus spores on your skin. They are everywhere, right? So um, they it's, it's not unusual to have spores on your skin. So if people end up getting it on their skin uh, from the oral probiotic, that should be perfectly fine. If you've got open wounds and cuts and all that, work with your doctor if you have active exactly. infection. Uh, but having it on your skin is a normal part of how we interact with these organisms. Um, so it, it's, it, it shouldn't be an issue and it could be beneficial as well. Certainly the oral use of it, because the microbiome is a central command center for how your immune system deals with lots of things, um, you know, distal from the gut, uh, that is going to be a place that really kind of helps train your immune system, trains um, your, your competitive exclusion bacteria, within the gut that will translate to places like your skin, your nose, your sinuses, and so on. But here's another interesting um, uh, thought as well. And I've had a few people do this and it may help. Like if you've got constant patches of you know dysfunction, right? And you may have colonization of Staph aureus there, you may have an imbalance. You don't have enough of epidermis, uh, and you know you've got you've got a micro microbiological imbalance in that area. One of the things I've told people is take swabs from healthy parts of your skin that don't have that and transplant it there, right? And in fact, um, a few people have reported back to me that they've seen um, really good progress on that, right? So let's say this is an area that I ha I tend to have. Um, you know, irritation, dryness, and all that. And I've used steroid creams, I've used antibiotic creams, and it hasn't really worked. In fact, it's maybe made things worse. One of the things you can do is kind of clean that area, just kind of basic soap and water, you know, reduce the microbial load in that spot, and then take a, a, a moist Q-tip and then swab a healthy part of your skin that you've never had an issue with, and then transplant it to that area. What you may be able to do is transplant some of your better micro eco ecosystem onto an area that is um, mm. struggling, right? So something for people to, to try and think about. Obviously, there's no harm going to come from that. It's your own bacteria that you're transplanting from one area to the other. Um, it's kind of like a fecal transplant that people do, but it's your own. It's an auto uh, autologous uh, transplant. So it's something for exactly. people to think about as well. Exactly. And actually, I want to ask you about the use of Megaspore with antibiotics. So say, mm -hmm. for example, someone is on oral antibiotics mm -hmm. because they have a staph infection. Is Are there any issues or concerns or is there a best practice of how to utilize the Megaspore? Because people are like, wait, can I take this with antibiotics? Mm -hmm. And how should I take it if I'm on antibiotics? Um, you know, I've always been told that you should try to separate probiotics 
and antibiotics by about two to three hours. Mm -hmm. But is is that the same case for a spore-based probiotic um, that tends to be a little bit more robust? So what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, you don't have to. I mean, and I would say if you're on an antibiotic, it's the absolute critical time where you do need uh, the, the megaspore, the spores in your system. We actually have uh, one study we published not last year, but the year before showing that um, getting the spores into the system will start to help to recover the system from the from the auxiliary damage that antibiotics can do, right? And that's the damage to the lining of the gut, the ecosystem, the, in, the uh, immunological response in the gut and so on. Um, so the spores do start to recover the system uh, back towards its, uh, its good homeostatic uh, state. Um, so, but you can take it with the antibiotics. You don't necessarily have to space it. Uh, we did a study on liver failure patients that are on uh, rifaximin all the time, and they were taking the probiotic spores with the rifaximin at the same time, um, and, and they still got a significant amount of benefit from it. If you could space it, fine. If you can't, you don't have to worry about it because um, you know it'll still function uh, within within the system. And why does it function, right? So then that brings up the question as well, like how does it function in the presence of antibiotics? Well, the key to spores is that when the environment is hostile to them, they simply stay in their spore form, right? They they remain in that spore form, which is a metabolically inactive form. So they're not uh, trying to come out and grow and, and do things that can then make them susceptible to the antibiotic. So what they'll do if you take it with the antibiotic is they have little sensors that stick out of the spore that sense the environment. And if the environment is not hospitable to them, they'll just sit in the spore form until the antibiotic is as either diluted to a low enough level or it's left that area, then they'll come out and start functioning the way they function. Wow. It's almost like they're like hiding in a little seed or shell and then they mm-hmm. like poke out when the, the, the uh, environment is just right. Totally. Yeah. And they, to come out. Yeah. And they can sit dormant like that for millions of years. You know, they're, mm-hmm. they, uh, I mean, there are bacillus spores that have been found in the digestive tract of ancient fossilized honeybees that are 50 million years old. And um, so these are honeybees that were fossilized in amber. Right. Remember the old Jurassic Park thing where you have the yep. whole mosquito fossilized in amber. They were able to find um, whole honeybees um, that were fossilized in amber like that in South America. And then they, they drilled in to see what's in their gut. What were they eating and what were, you know, what were they consuming? And they found bacillus spores in there and they could still plate them. They were still alive after 50 million years sitting in that fossil. Um, wow. There, there are uh, the oldest bacteria that I know of that have been found alive is in a in a cave in Southern California um, in salt crystals, right? So they were able to go deep into this recesses of the cave that is no humans ever been in, uh, and and the, part of the reason why they were doing this actually, um, and they've been doing this quite a bit uh, for years now, is they're looking for new antibiotic mechanisms, right? Because they're looking for organisms um, that have new chemistry that can act as antibiotics and compete with some of the pathogens. So they're going into deep recesses of caves where humans have never been to sample organisms from bat dung and from the surfaces and all that looking for new bacteria. So one of the things that they found in these salt crystals uh, were, were fossilized bacteria and when they dissolved the salt crystal, they were able to pull out bacillus spores and still plate them. They were still alive, and they were 250 million years old. Right? Oh, my god! Talking about ancient bacteria. They were here before the dinosaurs, and, uh, and they've been here ever since. Right? So wow. these are the most commensal bacteria. We've co-evolved with them ever since the dawn of, of man uh, or, or you know, ever since Homo erectus. Um, and then, of course, through the through the evolution of uh, Homo sapiens, um, they've been here forever. We've been working and living with them forever, and they provide us all of this protective benefit. And so that NIH study was so clear: if you have good colonization by Bacillus subtilis, you did not have this hot, this really scary pathogen, uh, MRSA. Wow. It has this protective effect. Wow, that is so cool. It, you know, it's the microbiome is complicated. Mm-hmm. I think there's also this also speaks to how much we don't know, mm-hmm. which is which is cool because it's like we think we know it, and then we're like, oh no, 
There's more to the story. There's always more to the story. And that's one of the amazing things. And I'm sure that's why you love what you do. Yeah. Because you have this opportunity to keep digging in and asking those, well, why this? And how does it work? And what does it do? And asking those questions. And then you get to come here and share it with us. (laughs) Totally. Yeah. And incidentally, (laughs) you know, the Fengerson is actually getting... Uh, the fengicin is that compound, the lipoprotein compound I mentioned that yes. bacillus produces that inhibits staph aureus growth. Um, that same compound actually has really strong antiviral properties as well. So it protects us from a number of viral infections as well. So this one bacteria sitting in our system producing a compound mm-hmm. that not only protects us from a, a, a common opportunistic pathogen like staph aureus and an antibiotic resistant version of that um, you know, nonetheless, it also does that for a number of common viral pathogens as well. And so, you know, it's got this plethora of functionality and effect that is so elegant that we cannot design that ourselves. As humans, we've never, that I know of, created a compound that can selectively inhibit a bacterial pathogen, and that same compound have an antiviral effect right? You would win the Nobel Prize in molecular chemistry if you could come up with something like that. And these bacteria make hundreds of these things, you know? They're just smart. They're, they're just smart, very you know? smart. They're, 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 <laughs> they're honed in on by time, right? Yeah. Time is what has given these organisms uh, the ability to do this and time and mistakes. So that's mm-hmm. the beauty of, of, of evolution, right? Evolution is a product of mistakes, genetic mistakes that occur. And bacteria um, you know, really house that oh, capability of utilizing back, uh, genetic mistakes for their good because they accidentally mm-hmm. produce these things. And when they accidentally produce them because they're trying to produce something else and there is an error in the sequencing of the DNA to, the, to protein, uh, to mRNA, to protein, and in that sequence, they accidentally produce something else. But then when that something else has a benefit to them or the ecosystem that they live in, they select for that and then make that a normal part of their functionality, right? So I used to do that uh, kind of research when I was at university, we call it directed evolution. We create a stressor in the bacteria for the bacteria that would normally kill the bacteria, but if you keep adding in that stressor and keep growing the bacteria, you will eventually find a version of that bacteria that is completely immune to that stressor, right? So wow. because it produces new chemistries now. So it, it's the nature is so elegant, so complex, uh, so mind bogging, boggingly, boggingly, what's the word? <laughs> I can't, I don't know what the word is. Uh, um, but it's, it's both simple and complex at the same time, right? The simplicity it to it is, is, uh, is really kind of alarming when you think about it. But then, uh, but then when you dig into how it works, it's so complex. Like you said, it causes us to just realize we scratch the surface. We don't realize things that are happening in this invisible microbial environment that, that is happening every minute of every day that we don't even know about. Yeah, it is amazing. I, I just want to thank you so much for peppering us with tons of incredible information. As always, I'll make sure to, to share some of the research that you've talked about in the show notes so people can go and take a look at that for themselves. Because I always think it's great when we can show what we're where we're pulling this information yeah. from. Um, and, and also, too, uh, for those of you listening, if you have more questions, uh, there's two other excellent episodes that Karan, I talked to him about many of these topics, but more in depth uh, earlier in the Healthy Skin Show. So I'll definitely make sure to link those up as well. And hopefully we can have you come back again. Hopefully it won't be two years. I know, absolutely. Well, um, we're all but, just at home, so we might as well get on Zoom and true, do this again, right? Very true. And I just want to thank you so much. And for those of you who are looking for, if you want to test out Megaspore, give it a shot. I definitely have it at quellshop.com, so you can go and grab a bottle if you'd like to give it a try. But we'll talk more about this in the coming weeks because I think it's an important tool that could be useful in, you know, your toolbox of what you're doing, whatever your protocols look like, it may be worthwhile to consider. So thank you so much, Karan. I really appreciate everything that you've shared and just making the time to come back on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. I hope that you loved this episode because, frankly, I always learn something from Karan every single time I talk to him. 
And I know a lot of you are really interested in possibly giving Megaspore a try, so I wanted to share with you some tips that I give my own clients. I know that my tips actually differ from what's on the bottle and even from what is written online, but I found that this tends to be more helpful for people, especially if you're dealing with chronic skin issues. So if you are a little nervous about giving Megaspore a try because you've heard that there can be like a die-off reaction or you might have a flare, yes, that can be possible. But really with anything in life, um, Megaspore can be a really powerful tool on your journey. And I use it in many of my client cases, especially where it really could do them some serious good. And so one thing that I typically suggest is that you start working with one capsule only and you open the capsule and you might only use anywhere from an eighth to a quarter of the capsule. So you start with a very small amount. And assuming that you feel fine over the next two to three days, you will then increase by another quarter capsule. And this way, every two to three days, you're just increasing in this small amount. You don't have to get rid of that capsule that you've opened. You just close it back up and put it aside and then use it the next day. And over the course of about two weeks, you will increase the amount that you take of the Megaspore until you get to two capsules a day. And it doesn't really matter when you take it. It could be taken in the morning. It could be taken at night. It can be taken with food or without food. It doesn't really matter. But if you find in the process of going through this step up that you feel like you're getting a little bit of a die off or some sort of flare or reaction to it, just like something kind of coming on. What I would say is just hang out in that spot. Let your system get accustomed to it. It's okay to take longer to ramp up and then slowly increase as you feel ready to do so. That is honestly the least stressful thing to put your system through. Because if you are having a reaction to it in any way, shape, or form, it could come as like, say, headaches, or maybe your stomach gets a little upset, or maybe you notice that your skin seems a little more bothered or angry, it just indicates that there is a lot of dysbiosis going on inside the GI tract, and Megaspore can be really helpful to shift that balance in your favor, but it does take time. And so depending on how dysbiotic your system is, it might take you longer to on-ramp to that full two caps dosage. So I just wanted to give you that heads up. And the other thing that you should know is that you can really add Megaspore to anything. So you could put the powder directly on your tongue and swallow with some water. It doesn't taste like anything. You could add it to a protein shake, which is what I do because I can't swallow pills. You could add it to some applesauce. You could add it even to mashed potatoes or just like sprinkle it right on top of some food on your fork and eat it. So that is a really easy way to get it into your system without having to stress like, oh my gosh, I have to open up the capsule. What am I supposed to do with this powder? It doesn't taste like anything. So these are really simple tips to help you figure out how to do this. And of course, if you have any questions, feel free to leave them on the post associated with this episode. I'm happy to answer them for you. If you'd like to grab a bottle of Megaspore, head on over to getmegaspore.com. That'll take you over to my shop, quellshop.com, and you can grab a bottle of Megaspore there. If you have not made a purchase yet, you're more than welcome to use the coupon code QUELL10 at checkout in order to get 10% off your first purchase. That's Q-U-E-L-L, the number one and zero, so QUELL10 to get 10% off your first order. And if you're looking for any links or the research associated with this particular episode, you can head on over to skinterrupt.com forward slash 182 in order to get access to all of that. And if you've got questions or comments, leave them there. That way we can keep the conversation going. And if you know somebody that has been curious about Megaspore and would love to know this info, make sure to share this episode with them as well as let them know there is a part one. So they've got to check out episode 181 and episode 182 in order to get a better sense of how Megaspore might be a really big helper on their healing journey. If you haven't done so yet, take a moment to rate and review the Healthy Skin Show on your podcast platform of choice, then hit the subscribe button. That way you get every episode to your inbox as soon as it's released. That way you don't miss any of the hope, the research, and the inspiration that we share here on the show. 
Thank you so much for tuning in and I'll look forward to seeing you in the next episode.